did was environmental exposures, but um, I thought uh, uh, Adrian, Eric, and uh, Josh, Mark, and George did a good job talking about how to bring in sort of classical risk factors into risk prediction as well as expand uh, the, the environmental component in our prediction models using uh, new technologies, using electronic medical records. So instead, I thought I'd really focus on bringing the genes and the environment together, or omics generally and the environment together. Um, okay. Great. So this, my one take home is that genes are important, the environment is important, and sometimes models that include both of them can be useful. I think sometimes we forget about that. Um, uh, both that each of, each of them is incredibly important, and they can be, but not always do need a model that has both. So we'll talk a little about that. So we've already seen models, examples of models that include environmental risk factors, and here I'm thinking environmental very broadly. Um, so including uh, demographics, clinical factors, could be biomarkers that you've measured. Um, uh, so Framingham for CVD, uh, the breast cancer risk assessment tool, or the Gale model for breast cancer. Um, we've had examples of uh, both a sort of chronic uh, predictor of uh, VTE, so sort of over the next couple of years, what's your risk, versus in this particular situation, you, you were just hospitalized, what's your risk over the next month. Um, so these are all scenarios where we have existing risk models that we're using in the clinic. Um, but I also want to highlight an example of a disease for which, despite a lot of effort, an awful lot of effort, um, uh, we've found really little in terms of environmental exposures that we can use in, in risk models. So for prostate cancer, we're left with age, family history, and ethnicity. That's pretty much it, uh, again, despite many, many efforts. So if you're thinking of like, so what can genetics add, prostate, in the con context of prostate cancer prediction, it adds an awful lot because we're starting from a pretty, pretty poor baseline. Um, so uh, I liked the cartoon that um, uh, that Zach Cohen showed yesterday, um, where you had uh, you know the situation where your risk model on the left is there you have your predicted E, uh, so your prediction of your, your your risk based on your environmental exposures only on the x-axis and your actual value on the y. Uh, you can see there's a reasonable reasonably good correlation there. And then you go to your predicted risk as a function of your genetics. Um, and plot that against Y, and there's a correlation, but it's clearly not as good, right? So why do we need the genetics anyway? Well, part of the point is, even though this is a noisy measure, if you put them both together, you're getting what seems to be a pretty substantially improved prediction. Um, and this is actually a situation that I simulated with is a pretty strong environmental component and a weak genetic component. I think a lot of times in the real world, we're in a situation like this, where we have an eh, okay environmental risk score, and actually our genetics is a little better, but not super good. Um, but if you put them both together, now you're starting to get something that looks a little more uh, intriguing and could be useful. So I will come back to, at one point, does this become useful? Um, but here, we're just sort of eyeballing R squared. It's like the R squared for the G plus E model is much better than either of the two alone. The question is, is that clinically useful? Okay, so I want to spend a couple of slides about how we go about building these models that include both G and E, but it could be genes, E, could be G, E, methylation, um, uh, a lot of things. Um, so at the highest level, um, so I, I sort of want to underscore <clears throat> Eric's point yesterday that there are sophisticated ways to do this well. I mean, so there's a lot of dangers when you have high dimensional data and small training data sets, you can completely overfit your data, um, but there are clever ways of avoiding that. Um, and I teach an entire course that sort of unpacks this cartoon. Uh, but the main thing I want to highlight here is we're not constrained, we're really only constrained sort of by our imagination. There's all kinds of different models we could be fitting. There's a realm of models that we are fitting, but the, there's, a, there's a universe that we could be fitting. Uh, and the other thing I want to highlight is that all these models that we're training, that we're getting out, are very dependent on the data set that we put in, right? So. It, we've had a couple of examples already where the transportability model varies, is, is, is actually hard if the application uh, where we're applying it, it looks very different than A. So whatever population A was sampled from, if we're going to apply it in a different, set, in a different sample, then our model's not going to work as well. But even within the same population, 
um, depending on how fancy your model is and how flexible, um, the variability in this predicted model could be very different. So that's why I sort of appreciated that Monty showed different slides um, of how the model would perform in, in different contexts. And, and George, with the models trained in the, in the, in the different uh, uh, data sets and how they performed across data sets. I think that's a really important thing to convey um, to, to both ourselves to make sure that we're doing an okay job, um, but also to the end users of these models. So right, so like I said, you can you can you come up with all kinds of you can do random forests, you can do uh, multi-layer neural nets, whatever. Um, but what happens often in practice is we fit simple linear models where we're just adding a bunch of g uh, a bunch of g's and we're adding up a bunch of e's. Um, and you get a little fancier, like you could have your in principle 10 million different b's for 10 million snips, uh, and you throw them into some sort of penalized regression to make sure you're not overfitting and really getting signal out. But this is essentially what we're doing. Um, so the question is, or a question is, are we missing something by doing that? So if we're just sticking with these simple linear models, are we missing something? And I think, uh, so partly motivated by the school of hard knocks, but I think there's also a little bit of theory in there um, that the linear model is actually capturing um, up most of the signal that we're seeing. So any potential gains from a nonlinear model at this point uh, are totally swamped by those extra model degrees of freedom. So like to really squeeze out that extra little bit of information that we have from the interactions, you need massive training sets. So we'll see a picture uh, in a second of the kinds of training sets you need, even for the simple linear models, which are huge. So going beyond that is gonna be hard. Again, it's not to say that there aren't these interactions. It's not to say that the effects of genes are not context specific or the other way around, that the effects of the uh, environmental exposures are not uh, gene specific. It's just a lot of those signals are gonna be subtle, especially when we're talking about variants that on average have pretty subtle effects. Okay, so, but by making this decision, which I don't think is a totally unreasonable decision, but making a decision that we're gonna, we're gonna fit linear models, uh, that actually has uh, implications for what we have to admit are extrapolated risks in the tails. So if we fit a logistic regression model where we're just adding up log odds ratios, that's implying that there's a multiplicative relative risk. So this is sort of what happens as a function of, not necessarily of the data, but of the model you've chosen, right? So I've plotted two things here, one is a, linear risk difference model, that's the gray line, and the other is the sort of um, logistic multiplicative odds ratio model, so additive on the log odds ratio scale. So you can see um, way out here in the tails, those two models, you can get more extreme, than I, I could have picked a more extreme example, but they're different, right? There's clearly a higher risk for people who are in the tails under the exponential multiplicative relative risk model versus the added risk difference. Um, but the point is, it's actually hard to tell these apart in a real data set because most people are way over here. So this is the middle of the distribution, 70th percentile, 80th, 90th percentile. Really, it's only out in the tail do you start to see a big difference. So if you just say, what's, what's a better fit, a additive difference or a multiplicative odds ratio model, and your data's gonna say like, eh, I don't know. Um, so, and I think, but, whoops, crap. Um, this is in fact, uh, the, potentially one of the, um, the use cases of these models is identifying those people who are at high risk. Um, so whether which of these models is a good fit is a really important question, and this has come up in discussions already. Um, so empirically, um, uh, again, it is hard to tell these two models apart, um, but when we look, and we have to look in really large samples to distinguish these, there seems to be more support for a multiplicative odds ratio model than a additive risk difference model. Um, and so this is starting to be an old slide, but this I think sort of illustrates what we're seeing in a lot of contexts. So these gray bars down here, those are the predicted risks um, uh, of breast cancer in the um, um, breast and prostate cancer cohort consortium. <laughs> and the black, the black uh, uh, bands here, the little triangles, those are the predicted risks, uh, assuming uh, that SNPs multiply as opposed to the risk differences. Uh, and then the dots with the error bars, those are the observed risks in the, in the, I think this is deciles, or no, sorry, in different categories of number of risk alleles. So you can see the dots, is when we get out into the tail, there's a, there's a lot of variability in that estimate, right? It's just really hard to pin that down because we need lots of people out there. Um, but it tends to be lining up more with the multiplicative model than the additive model. And if you do a formal statistical test, it actually is, statistically non-additive. 
Um, so this is just a plug for ongoing methods work in this area. So specific like looking in the tail as opposed to just does, is the what's the good fit over the whole distribution. Um, so uh, that said, uh, you know there may be situations where including some sort of gene environment uh, effect may improve model fit. Um, so you could constrain the effects. So you could assume that the, the interaction effect with every SNP in your polygenic risk score is basically the same. It's an assumption. It's certainly not true. But if in general things are at least in the same direction, then you might improve your model fit. Um, and another thing that I think that's a challenge when we're talking about gene environment interactions um, is a lot of times the populations we're studying I have a very limited environmental exposure window, which has relevance for, for, for finding exposure interactions. So this is an illustration of that. So say this is our sort of true um, uh, reaction norm. Here's the exposure. Uh, we have carriers or non-carriers. So you would look at this. You would say there's an interaction because the effect of the uh, genotype depends on the exposure. But if you do a study where you're only capturing this range of the exposure, say this is physical activity in a US population, um, then you're not going to see much of an interaction effect. Whereas if you could do another study, which includes a lot of people who are rural agri agricultural workers, now you're capturing a much wider range of the exposure, uh, and you're going to be better able to model that, uh, that, that difference. Um, and this is just another, in terms of if you're willing to assume that the interaction effect is similar, um, uh, like so if you're, this is your genetic risk as a function of your PRS, so there's clearly an interaction uh, between exposed and unexposed. If you're only looking at single SNP effects, you're going to miss it because there's just not that much variability and not much power. But if you looked at the PRS, you would have more variability, more power. OK, so this has come up several times. So you know, on some level, if you just have E and G and you dump them both in your model, you turn the crank, out will come a predictor, great. Um, the question is, well, maybe G doesn't really add anything because if once you put E in the model, especially if E is a mediator, we know it's on the causal pathway. Are we actually capturing anything? Um, and in principle, yes, if all of the polygenic risk scores effects are mediated through the known exposures and you've measured the exposures perfectly, which would include like at the right time, right? Um, and uh, that's probably not true. We're, we can do that. We're probably in much more in a situation like this where there are effects that, go, that don't go through what we know about the, um, the, what, the intermediate exposures we know. Uh, and we're not measuring the intermediate exposures that count. Really, we're measuring the proxies for them. So in this situation, then, I think you'll end up have the, having the genotypes adding something to the model. Um, and this is a really nice paper that came out last January from Frank Dudbridge's Dud group, where they sort of modeled this, you know, given that there is this mediating effect, um, at what point, you know, does the gene and the environment actually contribute to something independent? Um, so this is AUC. Um, the solid line is the AUC for an environment only model, which doesn't matter because here this is the sample size in the polygenic, uh, for training the polygenic component of the model. Um, so uh, you're basically getting the same thing, or at least the environmental signal is so strong that the, by, by the time you have uh, 100,000 people, you're capturing it. Um, so for a model similar to CVD, um, you're ending up uh, actually at the beginning because there's a little bit of there's a weak signal for ca ca capturing the polygene. You actually do a little worse by including the genes, but soon enough, once you have a, a large enough training data set, you're actually adding something. Um, whether you're looking at a genetics-only model or the gene environment model. Okay, so the important we can we can do better by including both G and E. Um, so the question is, is it useful? Um, and there's two uh, use cases I can think of. One is just simply spreading the risk distribution um, so we have more discriminatory ab ability. And the other is identifying subgroups where G will be actionable. So this is a little cartoon um, showing three different risk models. I've just ranked the percentile of risk from left to right on the bottom. And here are the relative risks on the y-axis. Um, so the environment-only model has the shallowest uh, gradient of risk. If you look at the genetics, it's doing a little better. And if you put them both together, it's doing a little better again. So it's not necessarily super game changing. Just look at this. But there are potential utilities, um, especially because this is whether this is useful information or not will depend on the action threshold, where the expected benefits of an intervention will outweigh the expected risks. Um, and that's going to be very field and context specific, right? So just to play around a little bit, if that action threshold is a relative risk of two, 
then adding G to your model over above and beyond environment only uh, will, will identify two times as many people with a risk greater than two. If your action threshold is up here at five, you're getting 10 times as many people. So again, it's a small proportion of the population, but for that small number of people, it could be incredibly useful. And then in terms of stratifying, um, so you can just see there's actually quite a difference. This is for continuous squamous cell carcinoma, uh, sort of basically the same picture, but there are two curves now, one for males and one for females, and the males are definitely higher. Um, uh, you see the potentiality of where genetic risk might be useful in one group or not another in the next slide, um, uh, where now it's not the environment, but we're looking at the, the polygenic risk effect among carriers of different genetic variants. So if you're a BRCA1 or BRCA2 variant, and again, I'm like, I am not going to die on this hill of a relative risk of two being the action threshold for breast cancer, whether that's increased screening or whatever. I'm just, just there for illustration. Um, uh, so if that's your action threshold, then I don't care what your polygenic risk is. If you're a BRCA1 or BRCA2 carrier, you're at high risk. Right, so we're, we're, that's, it's not necessarily going to have a change in your, uh, in your management if, again, we're, we're dealing with this magic line of two. On the other hand, if you're a carrier of check two, it could make a huge difference. Um, so whereas everybody would be just above or just below the line if all we knew was your mutation status, once we know your PRS as well, now we're actually able to differentiate people to those who are likely to benefit from the intervention and those who aren't. Okay, so very quickly on uh, sort of thinking in more detail about how to determine clinical utility. So the gold standard will be doing a randomized clinical trial of a stratified screening design. It's very expensive. It takes a long time. If we're talking about stratified treatment, maybe the, the, the clinical trials are more uh, amenable there. Um, uh, but one thing that we can do is uh, to run micro, if we're thinking of screening, we can run micro simulation models. So this is sort of what the CISNET group in cancer has been doing for a long time. So you have uh, your analytic model, which includes a natural history of the disease. It relates that to treatment outcomes or re response in the presence of interventions. Um, and it relates that to risk factors, screening behavior, new, tr new uh, screening modalities. And then you can look at outputs, which are things like how many people die of breast cancer, um, how many quality adjusted life years are saved under different screening programs. Um, and uh, we're starting to do this in, in, uh, for breast cancer, and I know some of the other sister groups are as well. Um, so here we're comparing um, the current recommendations, which is biennial screening for women starting at age 50. So this is everybody gets that same uh, screening strategy. So one size fits all. Versus this model, where you stratify people according to their risk. Now here we're thinking about it in terms of stratified according to polygenic risk, but it could be any risk model, like a G plus E, right? So, and then we, I'm happy to talk offline how we came up with these different strategies, but for each of these risk groups, you have different strategies. So here would be for the very, high, very highest risks, you should start mammogram screening at age 30 and come back every year versus the people in the middle who basically get the, the same risk categories of now. So depending on your risk, you're getting more or less intensive screening and it's starting earlier or not. So what happens when you run through these models in terms of the micro simulation? So relative to no screening at all, we're definitely saving lives in the one size fits all approach. Um, but we're doing um, a little bit better if we do the stratified screening. Um, so we're saving uh, 80, um, uh, I want to say that's out of 10,000, uh, and averting uh, nine cancer lives um, as opposed to six. So there's definitely benefits. Um, f finally, I just want to close is that uh, more can be better. I think you have to think about it won't always be better. You can, again, given the limitations of training data sets, the, 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 the dimensionality of what you're working with, how related it is actually to the phenotype you're studying. Uh, it doesn't necessarily always have to be better, but it can be better. Um, and again, just in the context of uh, breast cancer risk prediction, including a model where you have questionnaire factors, mammographic density, which is hugely important, the polygenic risk score, which is important, as well as emerging biomarkers. That's all going to be very interesting to, to, to look into that. Um, uh, there are practical challenges. How do you get a data set where you measure this on everybody? A lot of the large studies will have one, but not the other. I think we're coming up with statistical ways of dealing with that. Um, so watch that space. Um, these are just some things that came up during the meeting, but I'm out of time. And I'll just close with that. So thank you very much. Um, we can take a few questions, Mui.
And then Dave. And Mark. So, <clears throat> Peter, can you elaborate more on the role of simulation and modeling versus real real world studies? Uh, when when do you think they're the most useful? Uh, I know re clinical trials take take a long time, but do you ever envision a situation where modeling will um, you know basically <clears throat> preclude or does you know make it uh, so that you don't need a trial at the end? So um, I I have two. Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a problem we're all wrestling with, um, uh, and I have two responses. The first is, when we say modeling, those are empirically motivated models. Like you come up with a model, like there's a there's a model behind the natural history the n natural history simulation, and then that's fit to like real data, real like mortality data, breast cancer incidence data to make sure that there's some face validity to it. So it's not entirely like made up. Um, the the and then where I think there's a clear win for these kinds of simulations is when you're at sort of equipoise. Like, I'm not sure. Like, it's, there's something there. Like, it's sort of, it's sort of those kinds of things that uh, Amit has shown. Like, you know, if there's this threefold risk, we're identifying people. That seems like there might be something useful there. Let's take to the next step and actually see, you know, in a sort of simulated clinical application, how our public health education, how is this going to work out? Um, and if you have evidence there, then you might then, then I think it's, again, it's going to, I'm a classical epidemiologist, it'll depend. Um, so, you know, there will be settings where you could go to the trial and then you're, you're going to like sort of monitor it using real world data, right? So you'll roll it out. Uh, it, it becomes more of an implementation science. Like how do you do this to make sure that it's actually working, doing what you think it's going to do uh, and keep an eye on it that way. Um, and, but then there are probably other situations where you still want to do a trial. Dave? In the simulations you showed us in the yep. next to the last, or yes, that one, did you uh, try to uh, simulate what that revised sort of screening program uh, or more graded screening program would do or more individualized management would do to the economics? Yes. No, that's great. Yes. Um, so uh, at at right now, the, the simplest level is just number of mammograms. Like how many, how many times do people come in the screen? And the, that's the next, thank you for asking. Um, you actually do more uh, in, the, in the stratified, um, like on average, or like over the whole population, you're doing more mammograms. So it, it, it's, it, in terms of like the cost of the screening, it's gonna be larger. Um, in terms of the, you know, the, the benefits from the extra life years, and so that's the, you have to figure that out. Um, but I think this came up yesterday as well, is um, a lot of times when we talk about stratified screening, maybe in the back of our minds is, well, this will be cheaper because we'll identify the people who will benefit most and we won't have to, to treat the others. It's not necessarily true, and this is one example where... What about early diagnosis and the, the, the economic benefits of early diagnosis? Well, right, so that's, so I'm, I'm just, that's the part that I think we're in the middle of modeling. Like, like, um, so I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that there's not necessarily a free lunch in that this is, it's not that this is doing better in terms of uh, life years gained um, and it's cheaper. It's doing better in terms of life years gained. It's a little more expensive, but it's still better than just screening people more. Like you could also like sp spend a little more and just start screening earlier or screen more often. It doesn't necessarily help, uh, but you know, targeting the people who are gonna benefit from more intensive screening does. Um, Mark's question was the same as Dave, so thank you very much. Oh, oh Greg has one. Oh. Yeah, I was just okay, going to comment, actually. Um, so we've, I put in a grant twice now to um, combine genomics, trying to develop a, an optimal predictor of disease progression in Crohn's disease with economic modeling so we can discriminate between step up, step down, and targeted stratified therapy. And it's absolutely clear that the study sections are just, just are not going to go with that combination. So it's, it's you know... Uh, how, how do you bring that sort of modeling in with the genomics, which I think have to be done side by side? I agree it does. <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter.